I've entitled this talk, How Big Is Your God? But let's first pray. Father, I pray that you would give us each a clearer revelation of how big you are. And I pray you use my words to encourage and challenge each of us and to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's start with a couple of fun facts that I picked up when preparing for this talk. First, did you know that, uh, that the, this feeding miracle is the only miracle in the whole of the four Gospels which is, which, is, um, which is repeated four times in each of the Gospels? So it must be pretty important in my mind. Second, there was some discussion about how many people were in the crowd. Mark's account is very clear. He said there were 5,000 men. Uh, but what about the women and the children? And the theologians and commentators in general agree that there were probably closer to 10 to 15,000 people in total. So five loaves and two fishes uh, distributed uh, and feeding 10 to 15,000 people. And then 12 basketfuls of bread were picked up at the end as well. You do the maths. That's some miracle, some multiplication. Before we actually look at the passage, let's first remind ourselves of where we've got to in Mark's gospel. And in Jesus, his account of Jesus' life and ministry. The first five chapters record the start of Jesus' ministry and choosing the disciples. They include a number of physical healings, a raising from the dead, the healing of a demon-possessed man, and the calming of a storm on Lake Galilee. We can add in some more healing miracles and Jesus' teaching, both direct and by using parables. All of this backdrop demonstrates Jesus' power and authority and his heart of compassion for the poor, the sick, and the needy. Then we get to chapter 6, where Mark records that Jesus went around teaching from village to village in Galilee. And then a change of tack. He sends out the 12 apostles in pairs to do the same, to call the people to repentance, to drive out evil spirits, and to anoint the sick, and to heal them. And in verses 12 and 13, Mark writes, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. News about Jesus and the miraculous signs which accompanied his amazing teaching was spreading like wildfire all across the country. Even King Herod heard the news. And those of you who were here last week with Amanda uh, when she was speaking about John the Baptist, will remember how Herod was worried that Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead. Let's reflect on Herod for a moment. There's an interesting contrast between Herod's feast and Jesus' feast, the feeding of the 5,000. Herod had a big banquet for his birthday, a big celebration. He invited the great and the good. He invited the powerful. He invited the politicians, the military, and secular leaders. And he had a big party with them. And there was dancing, and I'm sure a lot more besides. And it ended with a death, a taking of a life, the beheading of John the Baptist. Jesus, on the other hand, his feeding miracle wasn't for the great and good and the powerful. No, he had compassion on the crowds. Normal people like you and like me. People who had come to hear him. And he responded to their needs, both in mind and spirit through his preaching. And physically by ensuring they had enough food until they were full. 
I'm sure there were people who were healed as well, although none are mentioned in this account. Herod's banquet culminated with the, with the beheading of John the Baptist, a savage death. Jesus' banquet with an amazing miracle and evidence of new life. Let's look in a bit more detail at what happened. There are so many lessons we could learn from this parable, but what I find striking and want to focus on is what it reveals about how big is our God. We'll consider first how big is Jesus' heart and then how great is his power. And third, how his actions pointed towards his ultimate sacrifice for all of us on the cross. So first, how big is our heart? If you've got your Bibles, you may like to look at verses 30 to 34. I'm just going to read them out now. Mark writes, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going, they didn't even have a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on, on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. Jesus' response was care and compassion. First, his heart, his compassion, was for the apostles. They were hungry. In verse 31, they hadn't even had the chance to eat. And they were tired from their travels. In verse 31 again, come to a quiet place and get some rest. It was an opportunity for Jesus and the apostles to get together to get away from the crowds, get some food and relax. And as a debrief for the apostles to share their excitement of what had happened when they went two by two into the villages around Galilee. Jesus cared for his apostles. He knew they were tired and hungry. And he cares for us today too. He knows our needs and the challenges we each are facing. Maybe he's calling you to get into a boat with him and go to a solitary place. It reminds me of the parable of the prodigal son. I prefer it being called the parable of the loving father because each day the father was looking out to see if his son would come back, seeking longingly because he loved him. And incidentally, he had a big party as well when his son did come back. So Jesus' love for the apostles, and then secondly, his compassion for the crowd. In verse 34, Mark writes, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. This is Jesus through and through, a heart for the people, not just his team of disciples, but also the crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children, everyday people, not entitled or important people, just people like us, people like you and people like me. Jesus saw the needy crowd and his heart compelled him to respond. The disciples would have to wait for a while. Here there was a large group of people who had come to find him. And I believe they were searching for meaning and were attracted to Jesus because of his wise words, words of hope, and also the accompanying signs and wonders. So what did Jesus do? Well, because of his love and his compassion and care for them, he pressed the pause button on caring for the disciples and instead turned to the crowd. 
And as, as it says in verse 14, he began teaching them many things. Let's fast forward now. It's getting late. There were no festival food vans or a local McDonald's for the people to go to. The disciples came to him and explained the problem. How would the crowd get some food and sustenance? Jesus responded in love. And as Mark's account unfolds, Jesus provided for everyone's needs. There was food for all the crowd until they were all satisfied. So Jesus' love for the crowds, for you and for me, compelled him to action, and all the people's needs were met. How big is Jesus' heart? Very big, beyond what we can imagine. I'm challenged here, because at times I limit his love for me, and I doubt he cares that much for me. Well, I'm wrong to doubt him as the feeding of the 5,000 miracle shows. So we've looked at how big is Jesus' heart. Let's now consider how great is his power. The facts are clear. There were 5,000 men in the crowd, probably 10 to 15,000 if we include the women and children. There were no restaurants or supermarkets nearby. And the disciples had found only five loaves and two fishes not enough to feed everyone. Let's picture the scene. Jesus got the disciples to sit everyone down in groups of fifties and hundreds on the hilltop. And we'll read again verses 41 to 44. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the fish of the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of people who had eaten, men who had eaten, were 5,000. I wonder what food for a crowd of 10 to 15,000 people actually looked like. What was available? I got a, a, a prompt here. We've got five loaves still, still from Sainsbury's, so they've got covers on them. So if anyone wants one afterwards for lunch, come up and get one. But the five loaves and two fish. Probably not smoked mackerel in a cling film sort of cover. Um, but yes, <laughs> um, so, so what would have been enough food to feed 10 to 15,000 people? What did it look like? If you recall, back at the beginning of September, we had uh, a bring and share lunch to celebrate Marcus's first 10 years here at Ascension. And there were probably 130, 140 of us in the church. Uh, and... Um, and the food was laid out on tables at the back. And there's quite a lot of it. And we all ate and were satisfied. Uh, can you imagine 10 to 15,000 pe people's food? 10 to 15,000 packed lunches. And how much food that would have looked like. I think if you look at the front of the church, it would have filled the whole of the front of the church, piled up really high. There's no sleight of hand here or misunderstanding. Everyone ate and was satisfied. One plate of food, or one basket of food, was enough to feed a multitude. Wow, that's a miracle about how big is our God, how great is his power. And interestingly, there were 12 basketfuls of broken bread and fishes picked up why 12 baskets? Some commentators link this to the 12 tribes of Israel and some to the 12 apostles. I like the fact that after feeding, everyone was satisfied. There's only a small amount left. Jesus had divided the food for this vast crowd 
and he knew precisely how much food was needed. And he broke just enough that everyone met and was satisfied. And there were only a small bit of food left over. There's no wholesale waste here. Jesus knew exactly how much was needed and how much would have been eaten in advance. And I believe he knows us and our needs to the same detail. He promised to give us what we need, not necessarily what we want, but sufficient to meet our needs and to be satisfied. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4 and verse 19, Paul writes, And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches, the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Let's look at what Jesus did again, reading verse 41. Taking the five loaves and two fishes and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided two fish among them all. Focusing on the bread, do you see a familiar pattern here? Step one, he took the loaves. Step two, he looked up to heaven and gave thanks. Step three, he broke the loaves. And step four, he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. Okay, he didn't say, take, eat, this is my body. But there's a close similarity to the Last Supper and Jesus pointing towards his self-sacrifice and death on the cross and on the third day, his resurrection. Maybe that's part of what Jesus meant later. Uh, if we fast forward to chapter 8 in Mark's Gospel, and there's an account of the feeding of the 4,000, and afterwards the disciples were asking him to explain what had happened. And he turned around to the disciples and said, don't you get it? Do you still not understand? We need to come into land now, so let's pull this together. We've looked at how big Jesus' heart is, how great his power is, and thirdly, how he pointed towards the cross. What does this mean for us? Where do you see yourself? Are you one of the crowd, one of the disciples? If in the crowd, maybe you want to see and hear this Jesus, Maybe you figuratively run around the lake to be here. You may have seen some healings done in Jesus' name and you struggle to explain it unless all this stuff about Jesus is real. You may have some friends who are Christians and you may have heard about Jesus from them or are attracted to him. Jesus says to you, here I am, take this bread and eat it. Or to use the words of John in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. If that's you, I'd encourage you to respond to Jesus' calling to you. And there'll be an opportunity at the end of the service to come forward for prayer and to talk with someone. Secondly, you might see yourself as a disciple, understanding in part, but not necessarily in full. How big is your God? Do you need to pray and ask him for more revelation to enlarge in your vision and your understanding of him and his love and his power. Maybe you've seen God at work just like the disciples did on their first missionary journey in Galilee. Maybe you've seen him move in power and heal the sick and seen him answer prayers. But you're tired, you're worn out, you're hungry, you're grumpy. <laughs> when confronted with a problem, you fall back into your own strength like the disciples did here. Let's send the people away 
and not make it our problem or responsibility. And, but it will cost so much money, half a year's wages, rather than to look to Jesus for his miraculous provision. I believe that Jesus puts his arms around you and hugs you and me like the loving father in the parable. And he restores us. How big is his heart for you? And then remember, the disciples had lots of one-to-one time with Jesus. And over time, they did get it. They didn't get everything right first time or even second time. But as they spent time with Jesus, they learned and they understood. Later on, when Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter replied, you're the Messiah. He got it. Maybe there's a challenge here for you and for me to practice his presence to spend more one-to-one time with him, focusing on getting to know him more so that we can have an increasing understanding about how big is our God. Again, if you want prayer at the end, please do come up. I'm going to ask the band to come up now and they're going to lead us in some worship. One, as they do, one final thought Amanda asked me a few days ago if there are any songs that I'd like us to sing today. And I asked for a children's song at the start. Unfortunately, I'm too old school and we don't sing it at Ascension anymore, but I think some of you will know it. And don't worry, those of you looking aghast, I'm not going to uh, sing it out loud to you, but I will read out the words because I think they're powerful words. And it goes like that. I'm not going to do the actions either. You can if you want to. Um, Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. Everyone look at Amanda. Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. The mountains are his. The valleys are his. The stars are his handiwork too. Our God is so big so strong and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do for you and you and you and you. Over to Raleigh.